Hi, this is Denise Tuweb. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm glad you could join me today. This morning, we're going to talk about um, step one in the NIST risk management process. And step one is risk framing. The process itself is frame, assess, respond, and monitor. And today we'll talk about the framing step, risk framing. What we're going to cover is an overview of the process. We'll, we'll define risk framing. We'll discuss the inputs and preconditions to the step. And then we'll cover the risk framing activities. And finally, we'll talk about outputs and post conditions. So the overview of the process, each of the steps in the risk management process is described in a structured manner, focusing on inputs and preconditions, activities and tasks, and outputs and post conditions that result from the step. The effects of the risk concepts that are described in chapter two of NIST special publication 839, um, tolerance, trust, are also discussed in the context of the risk management process and its multi-tiered application. So here you have a graphic of the risk management process, um, starting with in the middle, the framing step, and then you assess risk, and then you respond to risk, and then you monitor risk on an ongoing basis. So what is risk framing? Risk framing establishes the context for and gives a common perspective for your organization on how you manage risk. risk. Risk framing is what produces your company's risk management strategy. And your risk management strategy addresses how you intend to assess, respond to, and monitor risk. The risk management strategy is going to make explicit the specific assumptions, constraints, risk tolerances, and priorities slash trade-offs that are used within your business for making your investment and operational decisions. The risk management strategy will also include strategic level decisions and considerations on how risk to your operational, um, to your organizational operations, assets, individuals, other organizations, and the nation um, is to be managed by senior management. So that's what happens when you're framing risk. Risk framing happens at all three tiers of the pro of, of your organization, starting at the organization level, then moving down to the mission business tier, which is tier two, and finally going to tier three, which is your systems tier. At tier one, your senior management is going to define your organization's risk frame. And that um, means you're gonna talk about things like the types of risk decisions, the risk responses that you're gonna support, how and under what conditions risk is going to be assessed because you do have to do risk assessments. And then you'll talk about how you're going to monitor risk and you'll talk about what level of, to what level of detail are you going to monitor in what form is that monitoring going to take and what frequency are you going to use to monitor different parts of your organization and different parts of your information security systems. At tier two, you get down to the mission business level. And this is where your business owners, your line of business managers apply their understanding of the organizational risk frame that they got from tier one to address concerns that are specific to the lines of business and the individual business functions um, that support business at tier two. And here you'll pick up some additional assumptions and constraints, priorities, and trade-offs. Then at tier three, which is the system tier, your program managers, your information system owners, and your common control providers are going to apply their understanding of the organizational risk frame that they got from tier one and the additional information that came from tier two. Um, they're going to they're gonna decide how... Um, to actually secure your systems. All right, the, the risk management framework is the primary means for addressing risk at tier three. So, so now we've moved away for a minute from talking about the risk management process, which is covered in this special publication 839, to talk briefly about the risk management framework which is covered in NIST 800, Special Publication 837, um, just to give you some context. And, and this will be a brief um, side road. Okay, so the risk management framework is, again, the primary means for addressing risk at tier three at your systems level. 
So the risk management framework addresses concerns that are specific to design, development, implementation, operation, and disposal of, of systems and the environments in which those systems operate. The risk frame that happens in step one of the risk management process can be adapted at tier three based on the current phase of the system development life cycle that that system is in. And this is going to further constrain your potential risk responses. So you're pulling together all the information in the organization that allows you to, that, that defines the context in which you're making your risk-based decisions. Uh, initially, the organizational risk frames might not be explicit or might not be defined in terms that correspond to the risk management tiers. In the absence of explicit risk frames that describe your assumptions, constraints, risk tolerance, priorities, trade-offs, what can happen is different managers and business owners, different parts of the organization can have very different perspectives on, on risk and on how to manage it. And what this does, is it impedes a common understanding at the highest level at tier one of how information security risk contributes to the organizational risk and at tier two, the business uh, layer of how risk accepted for one mission or business function can affect risk with respect to other lines of business or other missions and business functions. Differences in risk tolerance and the underlying assumptions, constraints, priorities, and trade-offs are grounded in operational or architectural considerations. And you have to understand and accept this by senior leaders and executives within the respective organizations that you have to find common ground. Now we're gonna go back to um, the risk management process and begin to talk about risk framing activities. For risk framing, there are four activities. Oh, I'm sorry, not activities. I'm jumping past inputs and preconditions. Let's go back to that. Inputs and preconditions. Risk framing is the set of assumptions, constraints, risk tolerances, and priorities, trade-offs that shape your business's approach for man managing risk. And that framing is going to be informed by um, the governance structure of your organization, the financial posture, your legal and regulatory environment, your investment strategy, your business's culture, and the trust relationships that have been established within your business and across the organization. Inputs to the risk framing step will include such things as laws, policies, directives, regulations, contractual relationships, excuse me, and financial limitations. Anything that could impose a constraint on potential risk decisions. I'm sorry, I need to take a drink of water. Other inputs to the risk framing step uh, can include specific specific Im information from your business to make explicit the identification of the trust relationships and the trust models that derive from existing MOUs or contracts that you may have with third-party vendors or within your organization, the identification of governance structures and processes that indicate the extent of or limits on decision-making authority for risk decisions that can be delegated to the business owners or the line of business managers. The key precondition for risk framing, though, is senior leadership commitment to defining an explicit risk management strategy and holding mission business owners responsible and accountable for implementing the strategy. Let me say that again. The key precondition for the risk framing step in the risk management process is senior leadership's commitment to defining an explicit risk management strategy and holding mission business owners responsible and accountable for implementing the strategy. You have to have buy-in from the top. With risk framing, you also get inputs from other steps in the risk management process. So it's not linear, even though it's frame, assess, respond, and monitor. They're not linear, they're more iterative. Yeah, you start at framing, but then you get into the other steps and you realize you picked up some more information that takes you back to risk framing. And so you will get inputs into the risk, risk framing step from other steps in the risk management products process. 
With the guidance produced by the risk framing step and the underlying assumptions, constraints, risk tolerance, and trade-offs used to develop that guidance may be inappropriate to one or more of your mission or business functions. Also, the risk environment has the potential, let's just say it right, the risk environment will likely change over time. Therefore, the risk management process allows for feedback to the risk framing step from the other steps in the process as follows. Input from the risk assessment step. Step two of the, of the NIST risk management process is risk assessments. Um, and from your risk assessment step, you may get um, information that influences the original risk framing assumptions. You may do a risk assessment of a system or of a business or of your business processes and realize there's some, there's some things you didn't even think of. And so you have to go back, you may have to go back and, and reframe your original risk framing. Um, there, you may get information that changes the constraints regarding appropriate risk responses that identify additional trade-offs or that cause your priorities to shift. Let me give you an example. In the risk assessment step, you characterize your adversaries, including any tactics, techniques, and procedures that they may use. Um, and you talk about sources of vulnerability information. And they may not be consistent with how um, you conduct your mission or business function. Uh, a source of threat or vulnerability information that is useful for one line of business could in fact be useful for others or organizational guidance on assessing risk under, un under uncertainty might be too rigorous or insufficiently defined to be useful for one or more of your business functions. I hope that made sense. You may have to listen to that a few more times. Okay, input from the risk response step. This is where you're actually implementing controls to mitigate risk. Information uncovered during the development of alternative courses of action could reveal that risk framing has removed or failed to uncover some potentially high payoff alternatives from consideration. This situation may challenge your business to re revisit your original assumptions or to investigate ways to change established constraints. And then inputs to the risk framing step from the risk monitoring step. Um, security control monitoring could indicate that a class of controls or a specific implementation of a control is relatively ineffective given the investments in people, process, and technology. This situation could lead to um, changes and assumptions about which types of risk response are preferred by the by the organization. Monitoring of the of the operational environment could reveal changes in the threat landscape, uh, changes in tactics, techniques, and procedures, increasing frequency and or intensity of attacks against specific business functions that can cause you to revisit your original threat assumptions and or to seek different sources of threat information. So one step in the risk management process feeds into and informs the others. Significant advances in defensive or proactive operational and technical solutions could generate the need to look, revisit your investment strategy identified during the risk framing step. I know that um, that AI is 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 coming to the forefront uh, as a as a tool to be used, and your company may decide we want to invest in artificial intelligence, and so maybe we need to rethink our investment strategy. Monitoring the legal and regulatory environment can influence changes in assumptions or risk. Monitoring of the actual risk that you're that you're incurring might result in the need to reconsider your risk tolerance if the existing statement of risk doesn't appear to match the operational realities. So those are your inputs and preconditions. Next up, we're going to talk about risk framing activities. Risk framing activities include your risk assumptions, risk constraints, risk tolerance, priorities, and trade-offs. Okay, the task, the four risk framing activities, risk assumptions, task 1-1, one, one, identify assumptions that affect how risk is assessed, responded to, and monitored within the organization. Task 1-2, identify constraints on the conduct of risk assessment, risk response, and risk monitoring activities within the, within the organization. Task one three is risk tolerance. Identify the level of risk tolerance for the organization and priorities and trade-offs. Identify your priorities and trade-offs considered in managing risk. Task 
So let's talk risk assumptions. Task 1-1 is identify the assumptions that affect how risk is assessed, responded to, and monitored within the business. Organizations that identify, characterize, and provide representative examples of threat sources, vulnerabilities, impacts, and likelihood determinations promote a common terminology and frame of reference for comparing and addressing risk across disparate mission business areas. Your business can also select appropriate risk assessment methodologies depending on organizational governance, culture, and how divergent the business functions are within the respective organizations. For example, organizations with highly centralized governance structures might elect to use a single risk assessment methodology. Organizations with hybrid governance structures might select multiple risk assessment methodologies for tier two and an additional risk assessment methodology for tier one that assimilates and harmonizes the findings, results, and op op excuse me, observations of the tier two risk assessments. Alternatively, when autonomy and diversity are the culture of the organization, then you could define your requirements for the degree of rigor and the form of the results leaving the choice of specific risk assessment methodology to in individual business owners. All right, risk assumptions are your threat sources. That's the first part. Threat sources cause events having undesirable consequences or adverse impacts uh, to your organizational operations, assets, individuals, other, nation, other organizations, and the nation. Threat, in threat sources include hospitals, hostile attacks, human errors of omission or commission, and natural and man-made disasters. For threats due to hostile cyber attacks or physical attacks, attacks on your business, you provide a succinct characterization of the types of tactics, techniques, and procedures employed by adversaries that are to be addressed by safeguards and countermeasures deployed at tier one, at tier two, and at tier three. You make explicit the types of threat sources that are to be addressed, as well as those that are not being addressed by your safeguards and countermeasures. So you're gonna lay out the kinds of threats that you face and the kinds of threats that you're going to deal with and the kinds of threats that you're not gonna address. Adversaries can be characterized in terms of threat levels based on their capabilities, their intentions, and their targeting, or with even more, more detail. You want to make explicit any assumptions about threat source targeting intentions and capabilities. And you're writing all of this down, by the way, this is part of your risk framing step. You identify a set of representative threat events. This set of threat events provide guidance on the level of detail with which the events are described. And you also identify conditions for when to consider threat events in risk assessments. For example, you can restrict risk assessments to those threat events that have actually been observed either in your organization or by partners or peer organizations or alternatively, alternatively you can specify that threat events described by per credible researchers can also be considered. So there are threat events that we, that we know are out there somewhere or we know that are, that are being researched. We haven't seen them yet, but we're going to address those. So you have to make those decisions. What are we gonna, gonna target when we set up our, our information security program? What are we protecting against? Finally, identify the sources of threat information found to be credible and useful. For exam, example, example, sector information sharing and analysis centers, ISACs. Trust relationships will determine from which partners, suppliers, and customers threaded information is obtained, and it will they will determine the expectations placed on those partners, suppliers, and customers in subsequent steps in the risk management process. By establishing a, establishing a common starting point for identifying your threat sources at tier one, the, the organization layer, what you do is provide a basis for aggregating and consolidating the results of risk assessments at tier two, including risk assessments conducted for coalitions of missions and business areas or for common control providers. You wanna roll that up into an overall assessment of the risk faced by the organization as a whole. 
At tier one, business owners may identify additional sources of threat information that are specific to your company or, or organization's missions or business functions. And these sources are typically based on a particular business or critical infrastructure sector um, on operating environments that are specific to biz missions or lines of business. For example, airspace, uh, maritime, oil and gas, um, and also external dependencies, for example, GPS or satellite communications, you know, is that a dependency for the business that you're doing or for the, the mission that you're trying to achieve? The characterization of threat sources is refined for the business functions established by your organization with the results being that some threat sources might not be of great concern to you while others you know you need to describe in greater detail. So again, you're looking at the threat space, just seeing what's threatening us. At tier three, the system tier, information system owners and common control providers consider the phase in the systems development life cycle to, to determine the level of detail which with, with which threats can be considered and greater no, understanding that greater threat specificity tends to be available later in the system development life cycle. The next risk assumption con, uh, concerns vulnerabilities. What you want to do with respect to uh, vulnerabilities is to identify approaches used to characterize vulnerabilities consistent with the characterization of the threat sources and events. So you're still in the risk framing step, and now you're looking at vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities can be associated with exploitable weaknesses or deficiencies in your hardware, your software, or firmware components that make up your information systems, or the security controls that are used within or inherited by those systems. So you've looked at your threats. So after you identify your threats, then you start to look at your organization to say, okay, how are we vulnerable to those threats that are out there? Mission business process and enterprise architectures, including embedded information security architectures, which we talked about um, in the earlier video, uh, implemented by your organizations could be a source of vulnerability and you could be vulnerable, be vulnerable because of your governance structures and processes or your lack of governance structures and processes. Vulnerabilities can also um, be associated with the susceptibility of your business to adverse impacts, consequences, or harm from external sources, physical destruction of non-owned infrastructure, such as the electric power grids. Um, your business will provide guidance regarding how to consider dependencies on external organizations and third party providers as vulnerabilities in the risk assessments conducted. So you want to not just look at what's happening inside your company, but you want to consider any external organizations that you rely on to do what you do. The guidance um, can be informed by the types of trust relationships established by your by you with your external providers. You want to identify the degree of specificity which, with which your vulnerabilities are described. Uh, for example, you can describe them in general terms. You can use CVE, Common Vulnerability Enumeration Identifiers, um, identification of weak, deficient security controls, um, giving some representative examples corresponding to representative threats. So you want to, as part of framing, you want to decide on how are we going to describe the vulnerabilities. Organizational governance structures and process, processes determine how vulnerability information is shared across the business. Organizations may identify sources of vulnerability information that are found to be credible and useful. Vulnerabilities at tier two. At tier two, mission business owners may choose to identify some additional sources of vulnerability. Um, for example, a sector ISAC for information about vulnerabilities specific to that sector. At tier two, your program managers, information systems owners, and your common control providers will consider the phase in the, in the SDLC, and in particular, the technologies included in the system to determine the level of detail with which the vulnerabilities can be considered and make explicit any assumptions about the degree of organizational or information system vulnerability to specific threat sources by name or by type. What are we vulnerable to and why are we vulnerable? 
That's what happens at the risk framing step. Um, the next up risk consumption, risk assumption is consequences and impact. So you've looked at the threats, threat events, and your vulnerabilities to, the, to, to those threat events. Now you want to look at what happens if that threat event occurs. And you want to provide guidance on how to assess impacts to, to your, to your business. And you will use FIPS 199 if you are federal um, defense, you're using CNS, CNSS instruction 1253, or you can use a more granular approach. But you, ex you can experience the consequences of negative events at the information system level where, where it fails to perform, perform as required. I don't know why I'm tongue tied today. I'm sorry, guys. At the mission business process level, failing to fully meet your business objectives at the organizational level where you fail to comply with legal or regulatory requirements, damaging your reputation or relationships or under, undermining your business or organization's long-term vi viability. You want to determine at tier one, which consequences and types of impact are to be considered at tier two, the mission business process level. An adverse event can have multiple consequences and different types of impact at different levels and in different time frames. Let me give you an example. The exposure of personally identifiable information by, say, your human resources department can have organization wide consequences and adverse impact with regard to reputation damage. Information system consequences and impact for multiple systems of an attacker more easily overcoming ident your identification and authentication security controls and the exposure of PII by human resources can impact your mission business processes for one or more business areas where an, an attacker could falsify information on which you make future decisions. So you've got one breach, a breach of personally identifiable information by human resources. So your employer, your employee's information is now out in the wild. Well, it's going to affect your business, your business's reputation. So that's negative, but then it could affect um, your information systems because hackers have information on your employee so they can, um, easily get in to break into your systems using your employee e information. And then it could impact your business processes because a hacker could get in and change information in your company files. And you're going to use that information later to make future decisions. And so diff multiple consequences, different types of impact at different levels and in different time frames. That's what I mean. To ensure consistency, you want to determine at tier one how consequences experienced in different time frames are to be assessed. At tier two, mission business owners may amplify organizational guidance as appropriate. The types of consequences and impact considered in risk determinations are identified to give you a basis for determining, aggregating, and or consolidating risk results and to facilitate risk communication. You can also provide guidance to tier two and tier three with regard to the extent that risk assessments are to consider the risk to other organizations and the nation. Organizations make explicit any assumptions about the degree of consequences related to specific threat sources by name or by type or through specific vulnerabilities individually or by type. Now, this is a lot of words right now, but as we begin to work through actually doing this exercise, it will become clearer. But for now, just understand that I'm going over um, this special publication 839 and I'm following the wording in the publication very closely. And in most cases, and in many cases, word for word. So it, if it sounds very wordy and if it sounds like a lot of repetition, that is the nature of this special publications. I think they try to reinforce it by repeating it. So hang in there, bear with me. Let's keep moving. Next up, I'm going to talk about risk assumptions and the likelihood of a threat event happening. All right, you can employ a number of approaches for determining the likelihood of threat events. 
some organizations treat the likelihood that a threat event will occur and the likelihood that if it occurs, it will result in adverse effects as separate factors, while other organizations assess threat likelihood as a combination of these factors. Let me say that again. Some organizations treat the likelihood that a threat event will occur and the likelihood that if it occurs, it will cause harm as two separate factors while other organizations assess threat likelihood as a combination of these factors. In addition, some organizations prefer quantitative risk assessments, while other organizations prefer qualitative risk assessments, particularly when the assessment involves a high degree of, of uncertainty. And keep in mind, at this stage, the risk framing step, we are making, we're making decisions at a high level about how we're framing risk. Likelihood determinations can be based on either threat assumptions or actual threat data. And that means historical, historical data on cyber attacks, historical data on earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, or specific information on an adversary's capabilities, intentions, and targeting. When you have specific and credible threat data, you can use the empirical data and statistical analysis to determine more specific probabilities of threat events occurring. Select a method consistent with your organization's culture and risk tolerance. Organizations can also make explicit assumptions concerning the likelihood that a threat event will result in an in adverse effect as follows. You can say worst case, i.e. The, the attack will be successful unless strong objective reasons to presume otherwise. Best case, the attack will not be successful unless we have specific credible information to the contrary or something in between best and worst case, the most probable case. And you wanna document any assumptions that you make concerning likelihood. You can use empirical data and statistical analysis to help inform any of the approaches used to determine the likelihood of threat events occurring. Select a method that's again is consistent with your organization's culture, understanding of the operational environment and risk tolerance. Do what fits into your business culture. This is not the time to try to overhaul the way your company does things. You want to work with what you have at this at this level at the risk framing step. I think I said that right. All right, the next task is going to be task one, two, risk constraints. And I'm gonna stop this video and start another one where I finish up the other task. So I'm gonna stop here and I'll be back in a subsequent video to cover risk constraints and the rest of the steps in the risk framing process.